Okay, people are still coming in, I see. Yeah, we, we, we have just enough time for a sandwich, I have the impression. Okay, very good. Welcome back, everybody. I hope everybody had a, a nice Dutch lunch. Uh, and um, so we are ready for, um, for the afternoon session. And the first speaker is uh, Alvaro, Alvaro Herais. Thank you. Okay, so, yeah, you can hear me. All right, so let me begin, uh, of course, by joining the rest of the speakers in thanking the organizers for putting together such a nice conference especially after postponing it for two years. It's great to be back in person to, to meet people face to face. So it's really great. So thank you very much. And of course, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present my work here. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, this work with Mariana and with Thomas, Damian and Eric here in the audience. And as the title says, I'm going to talk about the mysterious asymptotic tadpole. So maybe a good way to start is to explain what the mysterious tadpole is. So does anyone know what the mysterious tadpole is? Probably no, okay. So the mysterious tadpole is just a story for kids, a book for kids, in which there is this guy, this boy who receives a gift for his birthday every year, a special gift by his uncle, and one year he receives a tadpole. And he brings it to school, and he's very happy with his tadpole, and the teacher explains that this tadpole is supposed to grow into a frog. Now, it turns out the tadpole starts growing, it reaches the size of a frog, and it keeps growing, and it never ends growing. So when I heard this story as a child, little did I know that it would be promoted to a swampland conjecture, which is the tadpole conjecture, in which basically there is this tadpole that seems to grow much more than one would expect. So after the kids' version of this, to smooth the transition from lunch to the talk, let me try to go to the, to the thing. So the idea of this talk is basically to, to talk about the vacua in, in string theory. So it's about the modular stabilization program. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about how basically how we can try to find vacua in which moduli, most of the moduli, are stabilized. In particular, because it is quite important if we want to describe the real world, right? So this is like the big picture. What are the conditions for vacua to have stabilized moduli? And now let me take a step back and be very precise about what we are going to do in, in, in this talk and what we do in this paper and what we are going to do in this talk. So the idea is to study F-theory compactifications on Calabillao fourfolds with fluxes. We know that if we turn on some fluxes on these Calabillao, some fourfold fluxes on these Calabillao fourfolds, we get an effective potential. And basically, uh, let me start introducing some notation now. We can rewrite this uh, effective potential uh, induced by the fluxes in terms of this pairing between four forms and this Hodge norm that we can define on the Calabillao fourfold. And also, we all know that the vacuum condition for such a vacua is that the vacuum, the four form must be self dual. Right? Now, in this talk, I'm going to focus on the complex structure moduli. So I'm going to, to, to study how we can fix this moduli, and in particular, I'm going to focus on the situation when we have a large number of, of, of moduli. I want to, for now, forget about the Keller moduli, so we can also ask that the four form is primitive, so that we are now studying a primitive four form fluxes, and we want to see how to stabilize moduli there. Now, there is another ingredient which is key, and it's going to be key 
for the rest of my talk here, which is the existence of a Hodge decomposition and a Hodge star in the middle cohomology of the of the of the Calabi-Yau fourfold. And I will go back to this, but basically following how this thing varies over the modular space is going to be the main uh, one of the main uh, things I'm going to focus on during the talk. So now the other important thing that, that happens when we turn on these four form fluxes is that there is some D3 brain charge induced by these fluxes, right? This D3 brain charge is just the interval of the four form flux G4, wet G4 on the internal manifold. And of course, we have to cancel this tadpole that we have here. So basically we have this positive contribution from the fluxes. This is going to be positive once we impose the vacuum condition that this is self-dual. And we have another positive contribution from possible end two brains and a negative contribution to the tadpole coming from the Euler characteristic, okay? So basically what this is telling us is, okay, to be able to fulfill the tadpole condition, we need this charge, this four form contribution to the tadpole to be smaller or equal than the Euler characteristic. So far, so good. Probably most of us know this. We can re-express this in terms of the Hodge uh, numbers. But now here comes the, the, the thing that this so-called tadpole conjecture, in which basically the, author, the authors conjecture that this flux contribution to a tadpole needed to stabilize an arbitrarily high number of complex structure moduli grows linearly with the number of stabilized moduli, like this. They give a refined version with this particular coefficient. And basically, this means that for an arbitrarily high number of complex structure moduli, they can never be, we can never stabilize all of them because we will never be able to cancel the tadpole. So the goal of this talk is to study this close to the boundaries of modular space. Okay, and the goal of this talk is tr trying to give a first step towards proving this conjecture or disproving it, whatever, in the boundaries, the asymptotic regions of modular space. So the outline of the rest of the talk is basically divided into two parts. On the first part, I'm going to give some brief review of, of asymptotic Hodge theory, which is the tool that we are going to use during the rest of the, of the talk. And basically, of course, it's not going to be something very uh, uh, exhaustive or self-contained, but I will try to at least give you a flavor of how it looks like and the key results that then we are going to apply for the modular stabilization in the fourfold. Okay, so let's begin with the first part. So asymptotic Hodge theory. So first, let me give some credit to the original mathematicians that did all this, and this has been used in the Swanbland literature, string compactifications literature by several authors. But the idea is we have our moduli space, we can move there, and we want to fix this moduli. So we want to basically see how we can find vacua in this moduli space by turning on fluxes. Now it turns out that there are particular regions of this moduli space, which are these boundaries here, in which we can choose local coordinates such that we have some axionic part and some saxionic part in a broad sense, such that these boundaries can be reached when we send some of the saxions to infinity. Now, around these boundaries, sorry, so close to these boundaries, we can actually enclose these singularities, and basically the action of this is given by some monotromy matrices such that, for example, the period vector is shifted and the, its action is given by this T. But the key point is that close to these boundaries, there is some structure that emerges and there is some kind of universality so that we can actually and we will actually be able to do things very explicitly. And one example for this, and actually one of the important results here, is that the, the, there exists this nilpotent orbit theorem for which, for example, we can always, close to a boundary, approach the period vector by some overall exponential that depends on the moduli that we send to infinity and on these log monotromy matrices here, which whose information is encoded in the monotromy matrices, such that the leading term 
we can extract the singular dependence from the leading term, and this other term goes to zero as this, as we approach the boundary, and we have some finite structure there. Okay, so actually if we zoom in close to a boundary, the idea is that we will have this universality close to the boundary, and we can define basically close to the boundary by sending a number of moduli to, to be very large, as I said. Now, in this talk, I'm going to require one extra thing, which is an ordering. If on top of that, on top of sending n sections to infinity, I impose an ordering so that there is one uh, section that goes to infinity much faster than the second one, much faster than the third one, and so on, I am in the so-called strict asymptotic uh, region, and then apart from neglecting, for example, exponential corrections in, in, in here or in the hot star, as we will see, I can also drop polynomial corrections in these ratios. And now there, this will allow us to give, again, very explicit results. So this is everything I say from now on. I am going to be focusing on this part here. So we are close to the boundary with this moduli sent to infinity, with this ordering here. And now the thing is, as I approach to the boundary, this Hodge structure that I had at the beginning, the one I said at the beginning, it typically degenerates. Right, because I have some singular things going on. Now it turns out there is a way to extract these infinities and define some structures in the boundary such that I can use them to give these expressions that I've been promising close to the boundary. These two boundary structures are the following. First, I have a Hodge decomposition. It is not the same as I had before because it's easy to see that the other one depended on the moduli that I sent to infinity. This one doesn't, but I have a boundary Hodge composition there that I can construct from the original uh, Hodge composition and from the information in the monotromy matrix, in the log monotromy matrices actually. And I have n commuting SL2 triplets, which basically can be built again from the monotromy matrices that I showed you before. I have these two things. So the first thing that I can do with that is, for example, to decompose the primitive four-form cohomology, which is the cohomology I'm interested in, into a sum of eigenspaces of the weight operators of these triplets. I have n of them, as many as moduli. I can decomp since all of them commute, I can decompose these into eigenspaces of all of them, so that basically I keep track of the weights of each of the, of the elements on the four-form cohomology. Now, the thing is, it turns out, at a more rigorous level, what is happening is I have the original uh, uh, Hodge decomposition, and I send a modulus to infinity, and I said one needs some kind of actually more refined structure to keep track of all the things that are happening there at, as I get close to the singularity. Formally, this would be a mixed Hodge structure. I don't want to enter into the details. I'm just introducing this picture so that from here, I have all the information I need, but I want you to focus only on this part. So with this, I can keep track of these weights, right? So basically, I have this. I send one modulus to infinity. The cohomology would split around here, and the height gives the the weight under the commuting and commuting SL2 triplets. Now, in general, when I send many of these moduli to infinity, what happens is I start with this. I send the first one. The thing splits. I keep track of all the L's. I send the second one, the thing splits further, I keep track of all the L's, and this way I keep track of these uh, weights that I was telling you before. Okay, so now I have these two boundary structures, and I want to use them to give a precise expression for the Hodge star close to the boundary, because this is what we are interested in at the end of the day, right? We're interested in solving the self-duality condition. And these structures allow me to give these, uh, these uh, precise and closed expressions. Now, the first thing that I can do is to define a boundary Hodge star with the Hodge decomposition that I had in the boundary. And it acts such that it maps these spaces that I had before, these VLs, into V minus Ls. OK? And in fact, these spaces only talk to each other 
when their total weight is equal to zero. And since this maps this to this, through, the, through this uh, product that I'm defining here, elements in VL only talk to elements in VL, and this is positive definite. Okay, so now I introduce all that, and it was basically just, as I said, to give you an idea of what the structures that we need and what we can do with them now. What we can do with them now is, as I promised, to give a closed expression for the Hodge star close to the boundary in this strict asymptotic regime when the moduli are sent to infinity and there is this ordering. And this expression is as follows. We kept track of all the L's, and when this Hodge star acts on one of these uh, elements of the cohomology with some given else, it acts as the boundary part, which is some finite part, and I can explicitly write all the saxionic dependence. It is just the ratios between the saxions in the order I, that I chose, and the exponents are just these else that we were keeping track of. Now, this is for vanishing actions, if you want. If one has no vanishing actions, what one has to do before to define this SL2 operator is, first, we apply some, uh, some operator, which is built, which depends on the actions. This is the action dependence, and which includes the lowering operators, that are operators that go down here. Now, again, I don't want to enter into the details. The only thing that I want you to keep in mind is, when I want to turn on actions and to act with the Hodge star operator on one element on one of these cells, I apply this. This will give me elements in the same L and lower Ls. Then I have a closed expression for each of these uh, elements, and then I ro rotate back. But I can have this expression, and I can keep track of the actions. So this is important because we are not going to neglect the actions. We are going to deal with them in the same way as we deal with the actions for the moduli stabilization. Okay, so now with this norm close to the boundary, we can just split these VLs according to how, to whether this norm that we were defining right before goes to infinity or goes to zero, or doesn't go to infinity or zero independently of the path. That is, depending on the path that we take, it can go to a different place. Uh, this should be a blue thing here and a red thing here. I don't know if you can see, anyway. And now, let me introduce the very last ingredient of this part, which are these highest weight states. So basically, so far, I told you that we have these boundary structures. With them, we can give a precise expression for the Hodge star close to the boundary. And actually, the fact that we have these SL2 triplets allow us to do even a bit more, which is, Basically, since we are keeping track of the weights, we can actually arrange this, all the states in the cohomology into irreducible representations of these commuting SL2 triplets. And as we do every time we have this, we can just find the highest weight states, and then by acting with the lowering operators, we can reconstruct the whole cohomology. And now it turns out that this is a very interesting thing to do because it is going to tell us what possible SL2 representations can happen? With what possible L's? So what possible dependencies of the actions on the Hodge star can appear? So again, we go to our diagram, and as I said, when we start going to the singularities, what happens is that the cohomology starts spreading around here. It, there is some rules for this, but in particular for the highest weight states, the rules are very simple. And the states, these states can do only like very, very few things. If we focus on this one, for example, which would correspond to the 4,0 form, it can only go up on this diagonal. This means that for each uh, section that we send to infinity, it can jump to one of these other points. It can never go back. So basically, we can go from here to here, from here to here, uh, and so on, or we can skip some steps in between. But this is all it can do. And the important thing is that there is only one SL2 representation that can do this, that can move along this part. Because all these cannot do it, and there is one single 4,0 form. 
So there's only one SL2 representation there. And now, the key thing is that, uh, sorry, this is the, what I was just saying. The key thing is that for the rest of the cohomology, we can only move in this inner diamond, like for, the, for all the other elements. And this is actually very similar to H3,1 copies of K3 surfaces, because this is the kind of structure that we would, get, we would get in K3 surfaces, just because of the dimensionality. This is a Calabi-Yau twofold. And now here again, the only thing this guy can do is to move along this diagonal. So basically, we can write all the possible highest weight states that we can have, where this index shows. So basically, we can stay here, or it can at some point go to one and stay there forever. It can at some point go to two and stay there forever, or it can go to one and then to two. And that's all there is. It's very simple rules. Now we can construct all the SL2 representations by applying the lowering operators, as I said. And basically, we can again arrange this according to the, these parts belong to this, has this pos have these positive L's that diverge. These ones, the Hodge norm goes to zero. For these ones, it depends on the path. But the key thing, and let, this is one of the main results that we are going to use, is that this is all there is. So you can have a very complicated four from primitive four from cohomology. You approach a boundary, and then all but one SL2 representation that can be more exotic, that is the one that corresponded to the 4,0 form, can be generated by this kind of guys. OK, so this is the, one of the important results. We are done with the <laughs> asymptotic Hodge theory review. Let me just recap the important results. And now we will go and apply this to our vacuum to our vacuum conditions, OK? So as I said, we are going to work in this region. And the key messages that you have to keep in mind for the next part of the talk is, first one, that the elements in the four form cohomology, well, the fact that we have these boundary structures allows us to say the, the following things. First one, that the elements in the primitive four form cohomology are arranged into irreducible representations of these n-commuting SL2 triplets. All but one of these representations are simple, are the ones that we just described. And we can give these precise expressions for the boundary and for the SL2 Hodge star operator, so for the Hodge star close to the boundary in this region here. OK, so let's now put this at work and let's use it to see whether we can make some statement about modular stabilization and the tadpole conjecture. So as we said, we have the self-duality condition, which close to the boundary in this SL2 region restricts to this. Right? And now let me just, uh, for convenience, as it will become clear in a moment, introduce this axion-dependent fluxes labeled by this g-hat, in which I just take the flux and I just apply this exponential operator that, again, this is very similar to what I was telling you about before, how the SL2 operator acts in the presence of actions. It is actually the same kind of thing. So basically what this does is I take the, the four form flux and I apply this operator. The pairing is invariant, whether I calculate it with the G4s or the G4 hats. And basically, now, let's put the machinery at work. So first thing I can do, I can expand this, the four form flux or the G hat, uh, four into this L, to this VL subspaces, because for those, I know how this guy acts. And then, if I just introduce this here, and I project with one of the components of, of GL basically, and I take into account that all these Ls are orthogonal. This is the self-duality condition, where the moduli dependence is hidden. The axion dependence is into the G4 hats through this thing. The Hodge star infinity acts, we know how it acts. It's a finite thing. And this axion dependence is extracted. So basically, 
for every of these vectors of S, for every of these L tuples that we have populated with the fluxes, actually with the E hats, we will have one condition. And therefore, if we want to stabilize moduli, we have to try to populate as many of these Ls as we want so that we fix this, this modulus, the modulus that we want to fix, and in particular, the N moduli that we want to fix. Now, let me give you a practical example of how this works. Because as I said, now we have, no, we have this equation, and we also know basically all the fluxes that can appear according to how they split in this irreducible representation of the n-commuting SL2. So we can go case by case and do all the fluxes. I will, not, I will only not do in detail the one SL2 representation that corresponds to the 4,0 form. I will uh, explain in a moment why I won't uh, uh, consider it. But basically, it will not be relevant for uh, the large for the case in which we want to stabilize a large number of moduli. But wait for a second, I will explain you later, but for now, let's see how this works. So just a simple example. I take this SL2 representation that is generated by this P02i, uh, which is the one that in this inner uh, Hodgkin diamond would be here. I turn on this flux. If I only turn on this flux, the tuple zero. And by applying the lowering operators, I get this G4 hat. So even if I, even though I only put one flux here, the G4 hat has several components. I can, in general, allow for also flux here and flux here. This would be the general, this is the most general flux I can have in this representation. So I, I'm not simplifying anything here. This is just what it is. And now I can apply this here. This is relating L's and minus L's, so this is relating these two parts here. So I get an equation from these two parts here, and I get another equation from this part here. These are the two very simple equations that I can get. I can fix the action with this. And actually, there's a typo here. This should be a plus, so sorry about that. And actually, first important thing that we see here is we can only fix this action if we turn on the G02 flux. This should be plus two. So we can only fix it if we have this thing here, because otherwise, we wouldn't have anything here and anything here. And G0, which is anti-self-dual, would be forced to be zero as well. So everything would be zero. So we need to turn on this flux if we want to be able to fix something. And if we turn on that flux, what we see is that when we insert it back into the Saxion equation into the other equation to fix the Saxion. The Saxion is fixed, but it is real only when the tadpole is positive, as one would expect from self dual fluxes. But the moral is that this SL2 representation is able to fix one action and one Saxion and give a positive, a positive contribution to the tadpole. Okay? This is the moral from this example. And now one can go ahead and repeat this for all the SL2 representations that we had. And what one finds is that for P0, one cannot fix any moduli with it. OK, fine. But for all the other ones, again, one SL2 representation fixes one axionic and one axionic direction, nothing else. And it gives rise to a positive contribution to the, it gives rise to a positive contribution to the tarpole. Now, let me go back for a second to this SL2 representation that we left, this, the one corresponding to the 4,0 form. The question is, this can be more exotic. Still, one could systematically do it, but instead of having four cases, one would have many more cases. But the point is that all these SL2 representations are orthogonal. They don't talk to each other, and at most, even in the highest weight case, this representation could only populate for different L, from different Ls. Okay, so at most, it could fix four, four uh, sections and four actions, so four moduli. 
So basically, if we are interested into the case in which we want to fix an arbitrarily high number of moduli, we will have to do it with these K3-like uh, fluxes. Now, another thing what could try to do is, okay, so now let me start, try to combine these things and see whether I can lower the tadpole and stabilize moduli or something like that. Again, the key thing is that all these SL2 representations are orthogonal among themselves. So basically, by combining them, I can make two of them or n of them act on one single scalar. This will only give me compatibility conditions among the fluxes that it, if they are not fulfilled, there would be no vacuum. But I will never find something such as a vacuum in which I basically a situation in which I can stabilize many moduli with just a few SL2 representations. Actually, tadpole-wise, the most economic thing to do is to turn on one SL2 representation for one uh, scalar, for one modulus, one real part and imaginary part. And basically, with this in mind, now we are ready to see this linear scaling of the tadpole, actually. I mean, basically, I already told you how this goes. So this one contrib positive contribution to the tadpole for each modulus that I fix. If we want to make it a bit more precise, we can write the tadpole. As I said, this is the same as this. We write it in terms of the G4 hat because then we can explicitly uh, substitute the self-duality conditions that we had before. Now I can split this into SL2 representations. Why? Because I will have at least N. For this, we can give this lower bound for this thing where within each SL2 representation, I'm separating, I'm explicitly writing the weight. This only pairs else with minus else. I'm only uh, summing over the positive ones, or the ones in B heavy, in what I call B heavy. That's why I get these two here. And basically, I get this greater or equal instead of unequal because I'm just neglecting the ones that come from V rest because basically, uh, I can have some contributions from there. They will not be relevant. Why? We will see it in a second, but now I can just plug in the self-duality condition that I had there explicitly. I have this G hat here, and I have N terms here. So at this point, one could say, okay, we are done. We have N positive terms for the tadpole. So it scales linearly. Now, someone here could say, okay, careful. You are working with this jihad. There are actions there. So maybe you can cancel things there. Now, the thing is, for each of these SL2 representations, the highest weight state is pure flux. Okay, because if you remember, the way this exponential acted is such that the flux with the highest weight state stays the same, and then it generates uh, axionic components in the lower subspaces. But I can always select for each SL2 representation the highest weight state, so I don't have this sum here. I just select the highest weight state. This is pure flux, and I have N components there. Now, I can just, if you want to make it more compact, we write this in terms of this gamma, which were like this, this quotient between the, the moduli between these actions for this asymptotic region, a strict asymptotic region, this ordering that we were introducing. And this is it. As I said, we have N positive definite terms with fluxes, this positive. So the tadpole scales at least linearly. And the key thing is that we need this, uh, this fact that one SL2 representation can only fix one action. Of course, all this, as I said, this modulo, this 4,0 part, but this is not relevant in the larger limit. There is actually one thing that I haven't told you. I will go back to this. It's about these fluxes here. Let me just skip it for a moment, and I will go back. But this is the result. This is what we have. In this strict asymptotic limit, the tadpole contribution includes n, at least n, if we stabilize n moduli, at least n positive definite contributions. This is the essence of the tadpole conjecture. I mean, this is uh, uh, the, the linear scaling, the linear bound. And actually, there is a very interesting thing here, which is the fact that 
we are seeing a qualitative difference between having a small number of moduli and a large number of moduli. Because for a small number of moduli, there is this SL2 representation coming from the 4,0 form. It can do fancy things. We can go to an example and have three, four moduli stabilized and think, oh, this can be very intricate. There could be very strange mixings here, whatever. Okay, but then when you go and try to do it for n moduli, this is what it is. Now, let me try to summarize these results from this part and then finish with some open questions. As I said, let me once again emphasize, there is this structure here which looks somehow like uh, H3,1 copies of K3s, where this is all there is. We can do the systematic thing. There is nothing with the P0. With the rest, one modulus, one, one SL2 representation fixes one modulus, gives one positive contribution to the tuple and we have this linear scaling. And here, let me emphasize one thing, which is extremely important, which is the fact that for now, we've only assumed that we are close to the boundary and we have this hierarchy, this ordering in the fluxes, but we have not assumed any particular thing about what boundary we are approaching. So this, this, this analysis, is not just for the large, the large complex structure point or anything like that. It works for any boundary of modular space, close to any boundary. Okay. So this is it. We have this. Now, let me just to, to give the main message once again, repeat that this is this qualitative difference between large and small number of moduli that we have to use these guys here. And this is the essence of the tadpole conjecture, that this behavior only kicks in when we have a large number of moduli. And now let me close with some open questions and some outlook, some possible things. So first thing, first open question, let's say, and actually the reason why I was very careful and on the paper we were very careful not to call this a proof, is the fact that, as I told you before, there's something here, we have n positive contributions, but there's the issue of the charge quantization in this SL2 basis. Basically, to solve the tadpole, to, to prove the tadpole conjecture, we would need each of these parts, each of these terms, to be at least one. If the fluxes were integer quantized, that's done. But in this SL2 basis, the quantization is over Q instead of over Z. So we need to make sure that there is not something going on like there is some inverse scaling with this thing with the number of moduli or with this gamma here. Arguing that the gamma part will not be there is kind of easy in the sense that this quantization on the SL2 basis is something that, as we said, that doesn't depend on the, on the moduli that go to infinity. Whereas this gamma is somehow the parameter that gives you how close you are to the boundary. So it's, expect, it's to be expected that it doesn't depend on that. Now, the key thing is to argue, like to be able to show that it doesn't depend inversely with the number of moduli that we fix, but with the number of moduli that we send to infinity. Now, this SL2 basis can be computed. I mean, there's an algorithmic uh, approach to this. You can choose your favorite uh, Calabilla with and choose the data, and then you can implement that into a computer and this can be calculated. But it is hard to find close analytic expressions for many of, the thing, of these things, and this is the reason why we cannot prove that in generality. Now, what we did is we scanned over some examples and we found some numerical evidence that this never happens. But basically, this is the only open question if you want to prove the tadpole conjecture in this context in this strict asymptotic uh, regime. Now, what to do next? Well, obviously, finish this and go closer towards the uh, go deeper into the bulk, right? To see whether there is something different or whether we can prove, disprove, or see what happens there. Now, the first thing that we could do, we prove this in this part here. We could go to this part here, to this nilpotent region here. So basically, this is 
eliminating disordering that I was talking about. We still have large moduli, but we eliminate disordering so that we have to introduce again the polynomial corrections in, in these ratios. There's a still, so leaving this strict asymptotic limit to go to just the asymptotic limit, there is a still some tools from asymptotic theory that we can use. And actually, it would be interesting because here, in this region here, there is, for example, this uh, linear scenario proposed by uh, Fernando, David, and, and, and Max, uh, which could be a potential uh, problem for the for the tadpole conjecture. So maybe by going there, we could find like there is there is still enough structure there, so we could go there to that part there and see whether they are missing something, whether there are some new things, and that would be the next natural uh, thing to do. Actually, the reason why I never talked about these examples before is that they do not survive in this limit. They need these subleading uh, polynomial corrections to build these vacuas. So they are vacuas that cannot be taken too close to the boundary. And now, of course, the next step, let's uh, maybe after a while, would be to try to go deeper into the bulk and see. In principle, one could think that, you know, okay, there is not much structure there, but it turns out there are some results here that, for example, the fact that Hodge of, G of G 2,2 fluxes in the bulk is algebraic. So, for example, in the bulk, we would have exponential corrections, all kinds of things going on. But if you restrict to that, to that part here, all these exponential corrections seem to conspire to cancel in some rightly chosen basis. So there is some hope that maybe we can do something there. But that's, uh, let's say, a long shot. So let's see. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, Dieter. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say something about this uh, distribution which is in terms of linear scaling? Yeah, so the thing is, in principle, what you would need for the tadpole conjecture to give you something meaningful in the sense of not allowing for many moduli to be stabilized is that these coefficients have to be greater than one fourth, right, to, to cancel this thing. They conjecture that it has, it's actually greater than one third. So we are not particularly sensible in the analytic expressions, we are not particularly sensible to this coefficient. But what we can do, and in these numerical uh, searches that we did to check the quantization uh, and so on, one finds always some scaling, so some scaling of the tarpole for the, 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 the cases that we checked. That is great, if I remember correctly, it's for all examples greater than one half or something like that, not 0.7, something like that. We, we cannot say uh, at this point, so the thing is probably to be more sensible to this coefficient, one would need to go deeper into the valve because this thing, so this is some kind of control parameter so that as you go closer to the boundary, which is when everything is very approximated, it was argued by Thomas and Damian and Eric in some other paper that this of order four would be enough to capture the, the thing, but still, it's kind of, we are, let's say here we can really pinpoint the linear scaling, the numerical coefficient, uh, I, I wouldn't, uh, I mean, in all, the, in all the checks that we did numerically, it is compatible with, with this greater than one fourth and one third, but uh, let's say we cannot give some analytic uh, reasoning for that. Okay. Um. No, no, so, so in, in principle... You can repeat the question for the... Yeah, so, so basically the question is whether the, uh, the tadpole growing like one-third, at least one-third, or alpha times 
well, I won't go back to the first slide. <laughs> so the tadpole growing at least as one third times the number of moduli is something that is valid for any number of moduli or just for large number of moduli, right? So in principle, the conjecture itself is just for a large number of moduli, so it's some kind of asymptotic statement. And basically, it also makes sense in the spirit of what we're seeing here. This qualitative difference that I was talking about between having an, a large number of moduli and a small number of moduli. With a small number of moduli, this SL2 representation coming from the 4,0 form can do more exotic things if you want, but as soon as you start stabilizing an arbitrarily high number of moduli, you have to do it with these simple uh, fluxes, these simple SL2 representations. So there is also a qualitative difference that we are seeing here. And the original conjecture is supposed to apply for a large number of moduli. Also, if not, it doesn't really say much about whether you can stabilize or not, because you would have other factors that contribute to the Euler characteristic that goes as this eight and these other Hodge numbers and so on. So it's not really a problem. With that. How can you ever disprove that conjecture? Well, for example, here, it could have been the case that we had found some, I mean, one way is you go to something with a large, to, to some particular clavier with a large number of moduli. Of course, that's super hard. But here we are able to really like study the problem, and especially for the large number of moduli, we can study it and we can say if there is some correlation between the number of fluxes that you need that give a positive contribution to the tadpole and the number of uh, uh, moduli that you fix. So we could have seen here maybe that, you know, one SL2 representation is able to fix, I don't know, 10 moduli, for example, or four, five, six moduli, whatever. We didn't found this. This is deeply rooted into the fact that the weights have to go from this to that and all this. But we could have found something like this here, and we didn't. So I think that that would be a way, I mean, it's probably not expected to violate the conjecture very close to the boundary, but still, we, one could see it like that, if you want, apart from specific examples. Uh, it, but maybe we can discuss it, later. Like, one more question here. Yeah, so in particular. Yeah, no, no. So, so originally we are we are starting with some fluxes, which are in the integer cohomology. The, in, the the fluxes in the original basis are integer quantized. Here we do some rotation. We go to these special SL2 bases, and basically they are quantized over Q, instead of over the integers. But 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 that's. Uh, that's what it is. I mean, this, this just comes from the fact that fluxes are quantized in, in the original basis, and, uh, and then we rotate them with some integer coefficients, so we can basically have quotients of integer coefficients. Do you have a uh, I don't think so, but uh, no, so I don't... Uh, no, I don't think we're sensible to, 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 to this here, but uh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we can... Uh, I can check and we can discuss this uh, at some point, but uh, I don't think this is included here. Welcome. Okay, uh, I think we uh, should stop here. Maybe if there are more questions, uh, postpone them to the break. Okay. And uh, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.